Are we recording? Oh yeah, we are. Okay. So hi guys. I wanted to bring in somebody that I respect in terms of the indigenous culture and the knowledge that he has been uh, giving me. And um, without further ado, I will let him introduce himself. Hey everybody. I am uh, Itzli Aheka and uh, I'm uh, happy to be here. And uh, today, so my background, a little bit of my background is uh, um, I'm a Chicano here. I live in LA and um, on my mom's side, she's a, she's a second generation Chicana. And so she's from East LA. My dad is actually 12th generation Chicano from New Mexico. And so um, we've been here for a really long time. And uh, today we're gonna, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, what it means to be indigenous to us. How do we, um, how do we decolonize and figure out, uh, you know, our identities and what our ancestral ties are? Uh, so yeah, happy to be here. Yeah. So I think the first thing we want to kind of discuss is, well, what does it mean to be indigenous, right? Like, what does it mean? I mean, does getting an uh, an ancestry test mean that you're indigenous, or is there more to it, or? Um, is there a combination of things? So we kind of want to flesh that out because that seems to be the controversial thing nowadays. It's like, well, what makes someone indigenous? And everyone has their own take on it, but we want to kind of clarify for us what that means. So I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, yeah, this is a, this is a, a really hot topic, especially when you have all, all kinds of people trying to claim indigenous, you know, you have a whole group of uh, African Americans, for example, who say that they're Native Americans, they're the old mix, and then you have uh, a lot of white Americans. You well, know. I will say, I will say that there are, there's a lot of African Americans that are mixed, but um, I do know that what you're talking about, the group that are saying that the old mix originated, um, that they're the, that the Africans were the old mix and were the originators, but um, I do want to say that there was a lot of mixture between indigenous peoples and African people. So, oh yeah, most probably definitely. a lot of that in, in Mexico and also in North America, definitely for sure. I mean, I found out I got I got like what five percent, <laughs> and I was like, what? Yes, Camaro, that's also five percent for <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah, five percent, and it seems like a little bit, but that actually equates to a lot of um, African ancestry. You know, so it's not something that uh, just can be swept under the rug. You know. And I just want to say that the 5% that I, I'm, I'm talking about is not the Arab. So it's not coming from the, the colonizers. It's the 5% that I'm referring to um, is, is in Southern and Western, like Nigeria and all that. So it is slave blood. Yeah, same here. I remember you and I had a, a conversation with a lot of people who were trying to deflect, you know, and uh, I mean, that, that, that's, I guess that's another topic, you know, but yeah, when it comes to claiming indigenous, it seems like everybody these days wants to be indigenous, right? And it's really an interesting uh, kind of thing that's um, springing up. And so you have you have some people who, like you said, you know, they'll just have to take a DNA test and say, "Oh, I'm indigenous. I never knew I was indigenous. Now I know I'm a native person." And then and then they have like the feathers in their hair and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yes, some people go really quick with it, right? And they're like, "Oh, I'm a native," and like that's it. They have eagle feathers and like what whatever they think indigenous is, that's what they are, you know. And that's what they they get sage, whatever it is. I don't know whatever is in their mind. But then you have other people who just sit back and say, "All right, I'm gonna just uh, be patient with this and figure out, you know, who my ancestors are." And you know, a lot of people I, I notice are really. Uh, struggling with that, you know, trying to figure out who their ancestors are. They always want to know what's my tribe. You know, I, that's like the number one question after a person takes a DNA test. The, the next question is, well, what's my tribe? How do I know? And I feel bad because there's a lot of uh, scams websites. There's one called uh, Somos um, Ancestry. I don't know if you've seen that one. I have. It is. Just, it's a scam. It's a scam site. Yeah. And uh, oh, damn. It, yeah, it claims to it claims to give you your tribal affiliation, you know, and so the fact that so many of our people are falling for that just shows like how um, urgent it is, you know, for a lot of people. And so when it comes to being indigenous, you know, it's more than just saying that you're indigenous. The most important thing that all indigenous people can agree on is that 
you have to live indigenous, right? And so this isn't a process that's like, all right, you're indigenous, I'm indigenous, we're indigenous, all right, that's it, that's the end of story, right? And we can start claiming these terms. It, it's and, much and start being that spokesperson for indigenous peoples. <laughs> Oof, uh, you gotta be careful with that. See, that's why I kind of want to do like a podcast in the sense that I'm learning and that I'm going on a journey. And there are people who are starting to ask me like, how do I do this and how do I do that? I'm like, I'm not sure I'm the person <laughs> that should be teaching somebody because I'm just learning, you know? And let me just say this. I'm not just learning to be indigenous. I'm just learning about the ancestors. I feel like I have been living indigenous all my life, but in terms of a tribe, um, yeah, that's where it's, that's, that's the thing I'm learning is the tribe part. The indigenous living, no, that has been happening. So, yeah. I think that's the biggest difference between us, uh, you know, Chicanos or Mexicanos and, uh, northern natives because um like you said it's in our culture you know everywhere we look uh you know we'll talk about that later but it, it's here with us and so like you said we are indigenous and so if you find a dna test it, it's only going to affirm what you already know and as chicanos we all know our Let, unless unless they're living amongst the colonizers and they're not living in chicano communities or indigenous communities or Mexican communities, then maybe for them it's a, a Mex I'm indigenous. And then it's a surprise, right? But if they're living in the indigenous communities and in the in the Chicano communities, then we've all been living like this yeah. together. Yeah, you're right. And it's it's part of the culture. And we know, I mean, Chicano, to be a Chicano is to be a native, right? It's, it's a native identity. And I know you talked about that in your previous podcast, and, and that's definitely true. And uh, so, yeah, it's embedded. And yeah, a lot of us are aware of it. Like when I took my DNA test, I already knew that I had a lot of indigenous ancestors just based on, uh, you know, my family history and family stories. Uh, I mean, you could tell just by, um, you know, the way that, um, you know, in Chicano families, you have a lot of different uh, skin tones, you know, throughout the family. So you can, you can see it there. Um, and so when I took it, I came out to be 40% indigenous, you know, in the DNA. And so um, I tested my dad and he was 50%. And so it kind of makes sense, you know, if you average out my mom and my dad, that that's where we were at. And so um, I had already kind of adopted an, an indigenous identity before I took the DNA test. So it was, it was just confirmation already. And so for me, what does it mean to be indigenous? It just means uh, doing the work, just living the culture, just trying to learn as much as you can and, and try to live as indigenous as you can, right? And um, kind of changing your worldview. And, and it's all part of the decolonization process because uh, we have to kind of identify what are, the, what are the foreign concepts, what are the indigenous concepts? And so it takes a lot of work and, and it takes a lot of years. And so that's why I say, you, you know, you have to really be patient with it to really figure out what's what. And uh, um, yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, of course, uh, all day. Um, no, I, for me, I always grew up, uh, I, my family, and I know some people are like, skin tone doesn't make you indigenous, right? But um, my family, when you look at what native ancestors look like, that's how my family looks. So. Um, and, and I've discussed it before that I'm actually a little lighter complected one to my family, but we were always darker. We always had that treatment, um, like I talked about with my grandma being separated in schools and things like that, and the treatment that we had and the, 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 the struggles that we had as people that were um, darker complected and um, not looking as Spaniard as others were looking. And um, I... I grew up in that Chicano movement. My dad was a Chicano. He was in the movement. So it was it was an act of decolonizing. It was a political thing. Being Chicano is not just, it's not just being Mexican American. That is so watered down. That takes the power away from being Chicano. When you say you're Chicano, or at least when you say you're Chicano, you should be saying that you're making a political statement. 
And that political statement is that you are rejecting the colonialism that has trapped your people for all these years, right? That's really what Chicano means. And there's a lot of people out there trying to define it from their Google search, right? They're parroting what they say from a Google search and they're not asking the people who are living the life. Um, whatever you're reading on your Google search were that we embrace being Spaniard. <laughs> I've never heard of that. The only thing I've ever heard any Chicano ever saying, like a real Chicano, not like people who don't know what it really means, is acknowledging that it's there because we have to acknowledge that privilege. But there was never, never an embrace, right? It's a political statement. And the word Chicano is actually a native, it comes from the native tongue. It comes from the Nahuatl tongue. So I am like really strong. Um, I strongly identify as Chicano because I think those people, um, they, they paved the way for a lot of us. They did the marching, they did boots on the ground. They were working, right? They were out there. And for a lot of brown people or people of color in general who are in college, who have nice little fancy degrees and then they wanna say that they don't support the Chicano movement. Well, that movement gave you a lot because you, you going to college is because of what those Chicanos did. So. I'll get away from that, I'm getting all gang gangsta. But um, what I wanna say is for me being indigenous is that I've always known it. I've always felt like I was living it. Um, I took a DNA test, one of my friends pressured me, but it really wasn't because I needed to find out if I was indigenous. I already knew that. I was finding out something else. I was trying to find out about a great grandmother that I thought might've um, had a, a different death than what it was telling us. So I needed to find out what, who she was and if the mixture that I had included what was told to us. So I had, it had nothing to do with, I need to find out if I'm indigenous, but it was a nice pleasant surprise when I found out another tribe I didn't know about, which was Budapecha, because my mom's side's kind of whitewashed <laughs> and they don't, they don't really connect to that indigenous part. So no one really talks about it, but on my dad's side, absolutely. I mean, we've always talked about Los Yanos and what it means to live there. So I don't, I'm not gonna ramble on. You wanna go on and jump in? So yeah, that for me, you know, uh, as in my life, I'd always ask uh, my parents, well, you know, what are we? And uh, my, it's interesting because my mom, you know, she's a second generation Chicana and she would always, she, would, she wouldn't refer to herself as Chicano. She would say Mexican American most of the time. But uh, she would code, sw code switch, you know. Sometimes I'd hear her say, yeah, I'm Chicana. But for me, she'll tell me, oh, oh I'm, I'm a Mexican-American. And it's interesting because she would say that. But then she really um, had the vibe of a Chicana. You know, she would use a lot of, uh, you know, Hello. Chicana words. Hello. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Like she called, she called her dad uh, Tata and she would say, oh, let's go to the Chante. You know, so it's interesting because she was in that culture she she lived it you know but she didn't kind of uh connect the identity whereas my dad he would always say i said well what are we dad he said well son we're just chicano that's all you know mm -hmm. and uh i you know it never it, the dna test actually helped me with that because but my mom said it's a little clearer you know she's here for uh, a gener two generations and then her great her grandparents were from chihuahua and so okay i can track it down but for my dad uh, he he could never tell me what part of Mexico we were from or what you know, and it wasn't until I took the DNA test and did the um, found out um, my ancestry that I realized why like wow he, his family has been here for twelve generations in New Mexico, you know no no wonder why they have no idea where they came from you know and I, fortunately I was able to track it all down and figure out exactly which tribes they came from you know but it was it was fascinating because you know that that kind of um, knowledge has been lost but at the same time like you said like I knew I was indigenous all my life we all knew because um, mostly how society treats us you know like my mom always had stories about how you know white people and the institutions the schools were always discriminating against her and you know she resisted in a lot of different ways you know she fought back and she didn't like it and uh when she told me those stories, my dad told me the same kind of stories. When, she, when they told me those stories, it angered me, you know? And I think that's how kind of how the Chicano identity kind of builds inside of you. Like, man, they, they mistreated my my parents. And then I get that anger, I inherit that anger, you know? And like you said, it's politicized within the identity. Well, and they say that our, our, um, 
this pain of our ancestors, and I've said this before, resides in us, right? It's in us because that trauma is like on in our DNA. And, and, and this is not like mumble jumble, right? This is real, this is real. That trauma is in your DNA. So how do you even heal that? And we'll talk about that. But um, I think that we, we are looked at, we are not looked at as white. I, I, I thought I heard somebody saying that, oh yeah, oh, you guys are just Spaniards. Ah, you know, they don't treat us like we're Spaniards. You go to Spain, they don't look at us like we're Spaniards. So I don't understand that. And, you know, I mean, I have like, I'm sure you have horror stories. Every, every Chicano I know we can talk to each other and have horror stories about how we're treated. And I mean, in, in some ways, you know, there weren't, there weren't a lot of um, um, African slaves in the West. We were those people they treated badly. We were the ones they were lynching. We were the ones that they were, you know, trying to treat, uh, like I said about my grandma, putting her in a different school. My grandfather, he had to, he had to go back to Mexico. They came up, he was born here, the stock market crashed. He had to go back to Mexico or face being lynched or other violence. And he went back when he was two, but the, my grandfather, my great grandfather took everyone back so that they would not be attacked or separated because they were sending back citizens. 60% of the people they sent back in the Mexican repatriation were citizens. So this whole thing of the illegal argument, get out of here. <laughs> um, it's happened before. And, you know, when my great grandfather went back, um, he did, he committed suicide. And I wonder if some of that trauma that he suffered while he was living here and then having to leave. And I wonder if that took a toll on him. Um, it certainly took a toll on my grandfather not to have his dad, you know, and they went back to, Jal to Jalisco, they went back to Los Yanes, they went back to like, what is it? The Grand Chichimeca area where we're all from. And um, he did come back into his twenties. And even as a lighter skinned um, Mexican, he was still treated because you can, you can see it on somebody, you know, he was still treated differently. Um, yeah, and I just feel like to kind of label us, I, I mean, what do people want to label Chicanos if they're not uh, descendants from the people that were here when um, the colonizers came? I, I, that's, that's a question I have, like, what are, what do they think that we are? And oh, I did hear, I did hear an argument that says, Oh, you guys are brown skin because of the Moors. I have 2%. You think that 2% is making me brown? 2% Moors. Do you think that's making me brown? And they say that and then you're like, "Okay, well, here's my here's my DNA test." And they're like, "Oh, that doesn't matter." Right? That doesn't matter. But you're arguing something and I'm giving you evidence that completely goes against what you're saying. You're trying to say I'm only brown because I have more blood and then the Moors are only coming up 2% and, and like, you know, 40 something percent, I think I had like 43, 44% indigenous and you say, no, 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 that's not what makes you brown. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that leads us to uh, the, the next point where, uh, yeah, Chicanos are just so misunderstood, you know, by Mexicanos and, and natives, you know, some natives, you know, we heard that there was a podcast they had where they, they were just um, comparing Chicano. Well, they were just kind of saying, arguing that Chicanos were appropriating native culture uh, inappropriately and that um, we didn't have a right to claim native, right? And so I think that, you know, that podcast was really long. It was like two hours. But I mean, they brought up some, um, some points that I think that... Um, I actually really, agree with some of it. Yeah, I, we should really, we should really listen to some of their points, you know, because, um, you know, on, on the one side, we, you know, you have Chicanos who are um, researching their ancestry and realizing, oh, you know, I'm Chichimeca or, you know, Nahua, whatever it may be. But then you have other Chicanos who take the test and then they're like, oh, okay, um, so I'm, I'm Native. And then they, like you said, they pull out the feathers and just try to, a superficial um, way yeah yeah and it's real superficial and and yeah northern natives rightfully take offense to that you know because uh they fought just like the chicanos fought they fought to have um access to eagle feathers for their spiritual beliefs and you know all the, the ceremonies that they have and and so you know it's it's fascinating because a lot of chicanos who um 
are uh, decolonizing and trying to um, you know, live indigenous, what, what has ended up happening is a lot of them ended up going to um, Northern native ceremonies and learning those ways. And so you have a lot of Chicanos who will say Northern native words like Aho or Mataco Yasin. And, is, is Turtle Island? That's, that's a Northern native, huh? What is it? Turtle Island. Yeah, Turtle yeah, Island. I hear that a lot and I'm like, I don't know if that's us. <laughs> Yeah, so so those Chicanos, you know, you can't blame them because it's their um, first step. They're in their first yeah. step of trying, but That's it right. is offensive to northern natives because they're like, you're barely starting to get into it. Now you you're that's not even your people. Yeah. So of course I can see that argument for sure. And the thing, yeah, the thing about um natives in the north is you know, the Lakota is actually the biggest uh, I mean if you want to like the Lakota culture is kind of like um, what the Mexica are in Mexico, right? They're like that, that's that standard. And so a lot of people in the North, they kind of lost their culture. And so uh, the Lakota helps them to, the Lakota culture, you know, the Lakota have really welcomed a lot of people and they've taught their ways um, to a lot of people, including Chicanos. And so that's totally fine. They're sharing, you know, you have permission. That's, that's not a problem, but um you know, when it comes to appropriation, you know, Northern tribes do see that in a certain way, like, okay, you're Chicano, but why are you, uh, you know, practicing our culture? You know, what, what, what's going on here, right? But at the same time, we have to talk about like, well, Northern natives shouldn't even be uh, talking, shouldn't even, like you said, gatekeeping, right? They shouldn't even well, yeah, be- Because it, if it's their tribe, gatekeep, please. I, I'm all for gatekeeping. Keep the posers out, keep the superficials out. But if it's not your tribe, you, you you kind of, that's not really your place to make a statement about someone else's tribe. If you're talking about tribal sovereignty, yeah, your tribe, um, you can say something, but each tribe should have their own voice. And when you're trying to speak for other tribes, you're taking away their voices. Why would you do that to other tribes? Let them speak. You don't know what their rules are. You don't, and, and, and they want to assume that everyone functions the way they do, that everyone wants to be federally recognized or can be federally recognized. They assume that. Um, and then, you know, they, they start to tell all of us, oh, you can't be indigenous. Well, okay, we might be stepping on your toes if we're, if we're trying to claim your tribe. But if we're not claiming your tribe, what, what is your problem? Yeah, you know what, you bring up a good point because that happens pretty often actually. And I see it a lot, uh, you know, Chicanos will be researching and they'll say, oh, well, you know, my family says that we're Apache. So, Navajo. <laughs> and then like if somebody, yeah, if somebody asks them, they'll be like, I'm Apache in Navajo. But but that that's a huge problem. I mean, that, you you can't do that, you know, because these, these, um, these Northern natives, they actually have, um, criteria on how you can join the tribe. So you can't just claim the tribe if you're not a part of the tribe, you know? And so something I advise people to do, I, I mean, sometimes you do actually I'm find scared. that ancestry, mm -hmm. uh, like that you are Apache or Pueblo or whatever, right? Yeah, sometimes it's legitimate, but <clears throat> if you're not a part of that culture, you're not a part of that tribe, you're not a member, then you can't say that you're Apache. You can't say that you're Navajo. What you should say is, you know, I have Apache ancestors or I'm of Apache descent because those are two very, very different things. And it's very, like you said, it's very, it's a very touchy subject. So, so, so and even with um, um, tribes from the South, I recommend the same because a lot of people will just say, oh, hey, uh, you know, I, I was born in um, Southern Mexico, so therefore I'm probably Maya. So yeah, I'm, I'm Maya. Uh, but without uh, being a part of the community, right? And so, uh, like for me, when I did my uh, my ancestry, the the gene gene genealogical research, I found that I have a lot of great grandparents on my dad's side from um, uh, Mexico City, and so a lot of them uh, I found so far about eight or nine. They're they're all Nahuas, uh, you know. They so they were um, from the you know related to the Mexica close to Tenochtitlan, uh, some of them were Tlaxcalteca. And so like for me, I can say, wow, I have uh, a lot of ancestry, uh, you know, that are Nahua. But if I if I say that I'm a Nahua, then, you know, a Nahua might ask me, well, what community are you from? And uh, 
I'm not from a Nahua community, right? What am I say? Uh, Los Angeles, right? And so that's why we have to be careful with our words and respect um, those boundaries, right? Yeah, and, that's, that's the sovereignty part. You definitely, and, and I, I I agree with you. I agree with the, the, the people who have issue when everyone's walking around and saying what tribe they're from. And if the tribe is in existence and you didn't go and ask for some per permission or or whatever their, their requirements are, then yeah, you are, you are, you're stepping on their toes in a big way and that's not good. And, but if your, if your tribe is like the Chichimeca tribe, we are actually, there's a lot of people who are talking about retribalizing and talking about bringing us back into the fold, so to speak, because I, I and, and this is just me. I'm not speaking for all Chichimeca. This is me. I'm just speaking for myself. But I and I see it in a sense that we weren't fortunate enough to continue to have a tribe. We were forced into assimilation. It was at the Mistan War and then it was the big Chichimeca War. After that, we were in war for like 40, 50 years, right? And by the end of it, they made us get it. They forced us into Spaniard culture. But it's not like we disappeared. You know what I mean? It's not like we disappeared into extinction. Of course, the tribe officially might have, but I, I see a lot of um, indigenous ways in the way that we live daily. You know what I mean? And in the way it, let, let me just make this clear. We didn't, Chicanos, real Chicanos, I, I'm not talking about Chicanos as a whole, but I'm talking about people who are practicing Chicanismo. We didn't just wake up and decide we're indigenous. That's not how it worked for us we were living indigenous. We were being treated as indigenous peoples, right? And then we were like, okay, so then we need to give power to this because we don't have to blend into Spaniards anymore. You know, we can now reclaim that. So we were being treated that way. We were living that way. And then we decided we reclaim it when that, when the sixties came out, because the six, even before that, but the sixties was a big moment because everybody was like, we're going to all claim our, and it, it was like a lot of people coming together and claiming, you know, the Boricuas were claiming their heritage. We were claiming our heritage, even, even the indigenous peoples, the Northern tribes, they were do they were having their movement. Um, there was a black power movement. So there was a lot going on in the sixties that made people say, Hey, we don't have to kind of hide anymore. We don't have to pretend that we're not in existence in terms of being indigenous. Um, and I do want to talk about what is it, what is it, what things do we do that are indigenous that you, you can't say we weren't living that life, you know? Yeah, you know, I think, I think that's a really important point because, uh, you know, claiming indigenous, uh, when you're living indigenous, it is kind of, um, you know, just doesn't follow. Because there are a lot of tribes in the north who, I mean, they lost everything. You know, they, they, they um, the Europeans committed genocide against them, moved them from their lands, and I mean, they, they lost their language, they lost their ceremonial ways, right? And so those people now are are stuck, um, you know, trying to live native, but you know, they might live in poverty, or I mean, they're just dealing with the effects of colonization. They're trying to survive sometimes, right? And so. Our situation is very different. I mean, our ancestors were trying to survive as well, but like you said, uh, when it comes to cultural practices, we're pretty much left alone uh, for the most part. You know, the well, Spanish. Say <laughs> it again. You would mask it, you know, like living. Yeah, I mean, the, the, Spanish, the Spanish didn't come and give us their food, right? Like they did with some of, like the English did, or the Americans did with some of the northern natives. You know, they said, "Oh, here's some flour and sugar. That's your food, right?" But that kind of, I mean, we, we kept a lot of our culture intact. I mean, the food is the, the biggest part, right? Uh, most of our food is indigenous. I mean, corn is the foundation of our food today. It's found in everything, uh, you know, at the yeah, market, tortillas. And that was the, the, that was the foundation of all indigenous societies in uh, Mexico in mm -hmm. Colombian times. Yeah, and, and I kind of see it as that when we were forced to assimilate, because we were, Right, that is not. We were forced to assimilate. There's some tribes in Mexico though that were that held up, and those people, man, I, I, when I see them, I'm in awe. Like, thank you. you, you I give, I give, I look at them and I feel hope because they, they, 
they were able to kind of sustain that Spaniard <laughs> uh, that, that came in and, and tried to take over and they, they kept their, their ways. But um, for those of us who were, or those of our people who were forced to assimilate, when they assimilated, they assimilated with the, the practices in there. They integrated it. And so now Mexican society, things that we know as, oh, that's very Mexican. That's actually coming from indigenous peoples. It's coming from our ancestors. So we're practicing indigenous ways. Flipping a tortilla, you're practicing indigenous ways, right? Um, Dia de los Muertos. I mean, that's one of the things that I would say when you're, we, we are very big on our connection with our ancestors. I mean, some of it is mass in the Catholic religion, but I think that Mexicans do it even more differently than other cultures, right? Um, the candle lighting, <laughs> we're so big on that. And I think that was coming from our indigenous peoples, even though the Catholic church kind of masked it so that they can bring us in, right? I'm not Catholic, but I'm just saying, what would you say about that? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm not Catholic either, but I understand that in Catholic churches uh, where there's a lot of indigenous people, they do use copal in some of those um, churches you know and so that I mean there's a lot of evidence that uh, the natives were allowed to kind of synthesize uh, their own worldview with the Christian worldview of course it was to different extents depending on where you were at like a lot of people a lot of indigenous people in the south today like the Maya um, in Chiapas they are able to really uh, incorporate still practice their original religion because the the particular sect of priests that were there allowed them to, uh, you know, to to practice it. But yeah, the Virgin Guadalupe, I mean, that was a conversion tool that they used. And they basically, um, you know, said that Virgin of Guadalupe is Donansing, and all of the people, you know, started to convert to Christianity. So that is an indigenous symbol, even though Guadalupe is European 100%. Uh, the fact that she's revered to this day shows that our ancestors um, gravitated towards uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. And, and, and we are in a sense like gravitating to her because of that almost that remembrance that we have in, in us that spirit that native spirit because look it's not just blood quantum we can we can argue that all day we are in agreement with that you can't just take a DNA test and say Ah, right. Um, but it is a, like a, a, a confirmation. And also when you've got the blood and then you've got the spiritual um, experience, then it, how do you argue against that and say that, oh yeah, yeah, you guys are, you guys are not one of us. I mean, and, and I, one of the things I had an issue with is that um, we, you, like I, you and I have talked about, we use blood quantum often is to kind of solidify what we've already known. Um, and so it's not as simplified for some people it is. Yes, I've met these people who I get their DNA test and they waving around and ready to step on a, on a throne, all right? <laughs> on an Aztec throne. And those people that, we agree with you guys on them. But um, when, when it's just those of us who kind of solidified what we kind of already knew, um, and it's more, let me rewind. Ah. Why is blood quantum okay to accept people in Northern tribes, but when we want to say, hey, this also proves that we are too, not just blood quantum, but our practices, our spirituality, and the blood quantum, why is it? No, 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 no. The blood quantum doesn't mean anything. Why is it? Why is that? I, I, that's my, that was my main concern listening to that one podcast is that um, it was okay for them to use to allow people to come into the tribe. But then when we use it to kind of say, hey, we, we are too. We're not trying to be in your tribe. We're just trying to let you know that we are descendants of tribes. Then it's no, 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 that's not, a, that's not as big a deal. Yeah, it's definitely a double standard for sure, and it's nonsensical, but I think your point where we have to identify the indigenous part of our culture and, and learn the ways of our people and build on that, that is where we're going to 
build our strength, right? Um, to really kind of defend ourselves against those kinds of attacks. Because if, if the argument is uh, blood quantum, well, you know, uh, on average, um, Chicanos are uh, forty percent indigenous, right? Forty, so, actually, from what I've been seeing, because they be sharing it, right? Forty to like eighty percent. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a there's a wide variation for thing. sure. But on average, you know, they did the National Geographic study, and on average, it was about forty percent. And that, yeah, that might be low, right? It might even be higher than that. Uh, and so that's very that's considered that's almost half, right? So a typical Chicano would be about what would. would expect to find half of their ancestors are indigenous that's huge right uh i i'm in some of these groups it's so annoying uh native american genealogy groups and it's all white people right and they're trying to find one ancestor that's indigenous right in order to claim native and i always get it i always get into it with them it's so frustrating uh and it's like wh why are you trying to find that one ancestor just just be content being white, like, why are you trying to appropriate this culture? You, you know, that that doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, like, and for example, they, and then they start gatekeeping everyone else. They think they could have the be the voice, and it's like, um, no, I don't care if you have one percent. <laughs> like, you don't get to tell me if I'm indigenous or not. And they do that a lot. Yeah, I think a general rule of thumb should be like, hey, if you benefit from white privilege at any point in your life. You can't claim indigenous. You can't, you know, not. And you know, like you said, Chicanos have never been able to claim white privilege. We're clearly um, treated in a, in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we don't live that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like we are, uh, you know, white people trying to figure out or trying to claim a native identity. No, it's uh, and we, I hear no more native, and we're trying that. to <laughs> learn more about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We're the trying person. to learn what was taken from us. Right. Yeah. You're, you're That's exactly. how I see it. We're trying to learn what was jacked from us, to speak like a Chicana, right? They jacked our culture from us. Some of it we were able to preserve. And then, you know, a lot of it we weren't. So what we end up doing is trying to find out what did they take from us that, sh that still belongs to us? What did they take from us? And that's not culturally appropriating. That's... That was ours. And someone else from other tribes can't tell us whether it's ours or not. That's not for them to tell us. And, and you know what? That's why that's why it's so important that when we show our indigeneity, that we don't show it in a way that is typically Northern. We, it, that's so important. That's such an important point, right? Like, okay, we go to our native ceremonies, we show our native, we should have our own songs. You know, if you're Chichimeca, we're, we're Learn your Chichimeca Chich songs, right? You can find you go to a sweat lodge with the Lakota. That's great. Don't sing Lakota songs. Give them your Chichimeca songs, right? That that is going to legitimize you, uh, you know, and and it's gonna it's gonna make you stronger. You know, you learn the songs. Don't burn sage. Sage is northern. You know, that has nothing to do with southern. Well, there, there's some there's some sage being burnt in our in our communities too. I mean, let's be honest. Sage, sage comes from the west. Our people were in the west, so. I don't want to say that we're completely banned from from sage, but like you said, Copal is more of our people. Um, but what I will say is, um, what else I gonna say? I forgot. Go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, th that border really doesn't mean much. You know, the the, the people south south of the border and north of the border. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of continuation of cultural practices for sure. Uh, and so like people like the Chichimeca, for example, they're going to have a lot of cultural similarities with, you know, people in the Southwest. So yeah, you're, de you're definitely right. Yeah. That's what I was gonna say. Sorry, not, not to interrupt you, but um, I feel like also it's not only to legitimize ourselves to our critics, because, you know, if we are always trying to legitimize ourselves to them, there's some people bent on not allowing us to have anything. It, 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 it's, it's kind of, it might even be racist in my opinion, but it's more also for us to connect with our ancestors because that's really the name of the game is to that reconnection to your ancestors. 
Um, and so when you're doing those singing and you're doing that connection, and I know that you have taught me a couple of things like, um, one, I love to dance. So you said to like burn that copal when you're dancing. And oh my God, that like took it up. I, I, I was in a trance and, and, and it felt really good. And I felt at peace. And I think that's really what you're trying to do is you're trying to find that peace. You're trying to heal um, that trauma that exists in you. And the way you heal it is you do the things your ancestors did that were robbed from you. That's exactly right. And um, we have a lot of learning to do. And like you said, there's sometimes, you know, you may be from a tribe that's extinct. And that's, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a dead end, right? Not extinct, right? You told me not to use that word. <laughs> yeah. well, what did I say to use instead? You said, um, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> but you said that it's not extinct because it's still there. It's just in it. Yeah, it's almost like any. I don't know how to. I don't know. I don't know how you said it. But um, I, I think I think there are so many different things that show our practices in terms. And 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 I think people are, when they watch this, they're gonna say, "Well, what what practices do we do that are indigenous Chicanos, right?" Um, and. and I think we were we were in a, in a private conversation. We were saying that we were um, that you can almost consider Chicanos a tribe, and I know that some some people laughed at that, right? But um, when the when the Aztecas left Aslan, they became the Mexica, right? And they kind of and, and so even with the Chichimecas, and when people migrated, they kind of like their their tribes became a little bit different depending on where they were with the land and all that. So when Chicanos migrated from Mexico, it's almost like we became somewhat of another tribe, although we're not, but that's, we have the language, we have a language, we have a culture, um, we have, there are things we can, like you were saying, we can recognize each other. So this is a tribe as well, but we wanna talk about what we do that comes from our, our indigenous ancestors that people are saying we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so so one thing that's really important to note is, uh, you know, some people, they'll take a test. I, I've seen a few people um, on Facebook and other places. They take a test and they're 100% native. <laughs> and I ask them, well, what's your ancestry? And, and they always say, oh, well, my, my parents came from the Pueblo. Right. And so those are people who just came, they just came out of native communities. And so they're 100% because they have like this unbroken lineage within the native community. Chicanos don't have that, right? Chicanos, we've, we've been living in cities for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, well, my family, for, uh, but others not, not, not as long, right? But uh, if, you, if your ancestors have been living in cities, you're, you should expect to find a lot of difference um, native uh, tribes. So for example, for me, I have found people from Tlaxcala, Azcapurzalco, um, uh, Cuatitlan. So there's a lot of different places, right? And so yeah, like you're saying, like Chicano uh, is or can be considered its own tribe because it's kind of like a conglomerate of a lot of different native uh, cultures. And like, for example, my mom, I always found it I always wondered, uh, she would always call her mom uh, Nana and she would always call her dad Tata. And I always, I would always wonder about that. I said, well, why do you call them Tata and Nana? And she said, I don't know, that's just what I've always called them. And I knew ever since I was young, I knew that that was not um, Spanish, right? I knew there was something more and, uh, you know, it, it turns out that they're actually Nahuatl words. And so the, the language that Chicano speak is, you know, it's got a lot of indigenous uh, words. And in fact, if you look at Nahuatl, um, uh, Tatsin is father. And so my mom called her dad Tata. And then Nansin is mother and she called her, her mom Nana. And so it's almost like, you know, the Chicano culture took um, these indigenous pieces and just kept them intact, you know, um, and kind of just built a culture around that. When it, when it comes to the spiritual journey, you know, we have uh, De Los Muertos. That's a really prominent feature in our community. And a lot of people take it for granted. You know, for me, um, for many years, I kind of, I, I just assumed it was um, Spanish influence, you know, for a long time. I, I didn't really look into it. And then when I started to research, I realized like, wow, this is an indigenous 
ceremony that we all practice and acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even like, um, I, I know you, you grew up in SoCal. So uh, I don't know if you've ever went to like Olvera on Sunday. And um, I used to go to Olvera all the time, right? And what do we find at Olvera? Of course, a folklorico dancers, but we also found the Mexica dancers. And that was a Sunday tradition. And it was ceremony because there's like, how, well, how, oh, there's like hundreds of us, there's copal burning and we all sit there and we feel at peace and we watch them. And, and, and uh, Mexica dancers are very big for our community, for Chicano community. It's not just Mexico, it's Chicano community for, for those Mexica dancers to go out there. And I know that Mexica is not all of our culture, right? But it's probably, I'd say the most preserved culture for Mexico. So when some of us are trying to look at what our ancestors did, we look at, okay, well, what did the Mexica did? Because like you taught me, you said that um, a lot of it is the, the base is similar, right? And so when we go to those Mexica ceremonies, which is like every Sunday, I know, I know we can't right now because COVID, but every Sunday, that's still a ceremony that we are attending, <laughs> that, that Chicanos are attending. And there's hundreds of us there every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I used to go with my grandma every Sunday and we used to watch the Mexica dancers and feel at peace. And I don't know, I think that's part of that community and that are tied to the indigenous peoples and proving that we are also in some ways a, a, a new tribe. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that uh, because, you know, the, those Mexica dancers, um, have, actually, if you look at the ceremony, it's identical to the pre-Columbian dancers. And it's really remarkable because, well, how did that happen? Like you said, it has to be preserved some some way, somewhere, right? And it was passed on. And the fact that they dance in a circle, we find that in the pre-Columbian code, he says that's, that's documented. You know, they burn the copal, that's also documented, the drum. Like these instruments, they, they even have these same instruments in museums, you know, from pre-Columbian times. And the, the drums look identical. It was amazing because I, I um, I'm in a group over here in Pico Rivera, and we actually um, skinned a drum for our group, and uh, you know we did it, and it was fun and all. And then, you play instruments? Uh, well, I'm not a drummer; I'm a dancer. Oh no, that's <laughs> I do, cool though. I do yeah. Good dance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it for um, like a few months now, but I, I did it before as well. But I, I and then I like a. A few weeks later, I looked there in, in this museum in Mexico, and they had a, a it's called the Malinalco drum, and it was preserved, and it looked exactly the same. And I was just like, wow, you know. So yeah, all of this is preserved, and this is part of our identity. And um, it's all identity. Business. I and mean, yeah, if it's you know, like my mom, for example, she I, I don't mo most likely in my research, she probably had uh, Yaki ancestry. Um, I haven't confirmed that yet. So, I mean, but the fact there's a lot of family stories around that. Uh, so I'm still kind of searching to confirm. So I'm not, I'm not going to claim Yaki, you know, until I know for sure. I, I can't claim it just off of family stories, right? Um, but the fact that she spoke, said Tata and Nana, that's Nawa, like you said, um, the, the, the Nawas were, Kind of held, held the role in Mexico kind of similar to what the Lakota did in the north. They kind of like um, helped people preserve their cultures. There's evidence that the Chichimeca, they um, adopted a lot of the, the Nahua words. Uh, and, and so they did that in a way to help preserve their own understandings and worldview. And yeah, like you said, it's very similar, especially if you go to, uh, I mean, with all natives, there's similarities, a lot of similarities, you know, reverence for birds and respect for nature. And uh, the idea that we're all cousins with, uh, you know, the animals. Um, so, I mean, that's common to all natives. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think I think that's a great strategy, just learning about, um, because it's, tr it's so well preserved. We have the songs, we know the exact ceremonies, we know the calendar. I mean, it's really amazing how much has been preserved with the Mexica. So I think, yeah, learning, if you, if you don't know uh, your tribe, learning, starting there, I think is a great place because then you can um, kind of learn what is the indigenous worldview and the worldview of uh, other people, you know, a lot of times it's, it's very similar. And in a, a lot of ways it's identical when you go 
to the south. Like you see, you see Tezcatlipoca in um, Tenochtitlan, you see Tezcatlipoca in Tlaxcala, you see him in the Maya world, even the Olmecs, right? And so there's a, there's some things, there's some parts of the culture that it, that are really cohesive um, parts of the culture. So if you learn about Tezcatlipoca, you know, you're, you're automatically going to learn about a lot about your culture. So I think that, um, you know, because it's so well preserved, I think that we, we should definitely lean on that. Uh, and then fill and in instead the of, Instead of trying to look at the Northern natives, unless you're a Northern native and you have been accepted in a tribe, you really shouldn't be looking at them. You can you can look at an admiration and say like they were they're in some ways, I don't know if they're cousins or they're like part of the familia some way, right? But um, I think that you, there's you won't find that that spiritual journey you're looking for if you're going to go to somebody else's culture that's not your culture that that healing that you're looking for because there there's a healing I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys man there's a healing that you start to find there's some peace i never thought i would be peaceful if you guys cannot tell i'm hyper but there's some peace inside of me now and i i don't i don't know i really believe that it's this journey that i take um to kind of reconnect to my people um, in, in a deeper way, because like we were saying, there's a lot of different things that we're already doing, right? When I make my chile in the Moltajete, that, that's, that's indigenous. There's so many different things that we do already that's already indigenous. So we're already living an indigenous path. Um, path. We're already on it, for those of you who are living that. But um, when you want to go deeper, you have to go deeper with your ancestors. You got to speak to them. It's, it's kind of a calling. And you have to speak to them. And if you're speaking to someone else's ancestors, it's like you walking in, you're walking in your 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 familia's house, hoping that it's your familia and it's a bunch of strangers. <laughs> and you're like, Yay! But you know, oh, who are you? Who are you? Well, who are you? Right? Instead, if you want to walk in to to your home, you want people and you want to kind of know those are your people. That there's a whole thing with that. So um, make sure you're not culturally appropriate in northern color, cultures. Although they have, uh, and, and, and let me just say this, not all Northern natives uh, are, have that voice that that one podcast does. I have spoken to Northern natives and they're the first, uh, there's so many of them that are like, yeah, you, you guys are one of us. You guys should, you know, need to realize that. And there, there's a lot of them that are like that, but you know, there's some that are like that podcast that we heard and, you know, they want to, um, they want to fulfill colonizer ways they're, it's ironic they're calling themselves decolonizing, but they're over there um, playing right into the colonizer game by fighting each other and not trying to regroup. Yes, keep the posters out. I'm with you on that. But let's make sure that we're also uh, not gaping, keeping people out of their ancestry. That That's important. People need to come back home. And if it's not your house, why are you gatekeeping that one house that's not yours? You know, I don't know but I'll stop on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I've experienced the same. There are a lot of um, elders actually in the Northern regions are the ones who know and acknowledge because they know the stories. A lot of elders will say, oh yeah, my, my ancestors live with Aztecs. We know about Aslan. And so I, I, I see a lot of younger people kind of pushing back against that. Um, so yeah, it's not everybody. There's a lot of well, northern... because there are some people that are actually, you know, they're they're oversimplifying it, right? They're oversimplifying that whole experience. They're just like, oh, I'm indigenous and I'm a Mexica, and a lot of people are saying they're Mexica, and there's like hundreds of tribes in Mexico. You're not just because you're a Mexica means Aztec, right? And some it's kind of not interchangeable, but the Aztecs were. Hold on, my computer will die, and I'll go black again. Um, like meaning I won't be here. Um, uh, the Aztecs um, are not the only tribe. Just because you're Mexican doesn't mean you're an Aztec or you're a Mexica, right? You're you have to figure out what you are. Um, as the the Mexica did preserve their culture, and so a lot of what they have, you probably have some something similar, but you still should learn yours. Yeah, and like and from the Chichimeca region, for example, uh, you know you can look at. Uh, neighboring um, neighboring communities because they're they're all related in some way, and so you know I suggest really learning the language as much as you can, 
um, any native language will, will help you. And also, you know, learning songs, uh, just like you said, you know, burning copal, all of these are um, ways that we can really live indigenous, uh, you know, eating the foods, even though food is a big part of, um, uh, you know, what we do, there's still other foods out there that are ancestral that we may not be familiar with. Like, for example, chia, you know, chia was a really important plant, um, you know, for all natives in, in the South. And so- Even like nopales, right? <laughs> nopales, yeah. So re, just even reincorporating, decolonizing your diet, that's a big movement too. Yeah. Just doing that, it, you know, it's gonna take you back to living a healthier way. You know, the, uh, the Chichimeca uh, were actually always considered to be um, the healthiest natives, okay? Everybody who talked about the Chichimeca, they said, man, Chichimeca, they're strong, they're fast, they can climb mountains like nothing, right? And that they, they the the Mexica would always say they it's their diet was always a, a really good diet, and uh, they were just really strong. You know, one time there's a there's a story where the Mexica they go to go find Aslan, and uh, along the way they find Chichimeca people, and um, there's a Chichimeca old man, you know, guiding them up, up a mountain, and the Mexica can't even keep up to him. He's walking so fast. And he said, wow, what are you guys eating over there? You know, it's weighing you down. What, what, what's happening? And so, I mean, that's part of it. You know, fitness, you know, chichimecas, that they, what is a chichimeca diet, right? How do we decolonize in that way? Um, and so, yeah, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but those are just a few examples. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to, to learn the customs of your ways. I mean, one thing I will say, and I think I touched upon this on my my last uh, solo video is that um, you know you're on the right path when you start to get like communication from um, animals when they start to come to you when you start to hear things when you start to get signs I don't know I oh I, I I feel like the further I get into it the more I feel like I can I can feel my ancestors speaking to me sometimes. You know, I can feel them. I can, I can see their guidance. I can see things that they're doing and I can get that sense of, well, you know, they must be there um, kind of guiding me in, in making sure that I'm on that right path. And then a lot of times, like, you know, for instance, like if I am, I'm struggling with a situation, I, I, I forget what it was. There was something I was struggling with and I found a tarantula in my pool. I've never seen a tarantula in a wild, but I found a tarantula in my pool. And it was like, to me, it was like a sign. You get these signs, right? Or one time I was, uh, there was, I was talking about something and I had a dragonfly follow me for two hours while I was hiking. It would not go away. And these are the type of things that you're kind of like, what are they, what is this? You know, why are they, communicating with me so to speak I, I don't feel like I communicated with animals before cats <laughs> dogs but not like really out there animals you know and, and, and I've talked about my my Nawali and the hawk right the, and and now if I take a walk around the neighborhood there's always a hawk up there and it's watching and it'll stop if I stop it'll stop on the pole and watch me <laughs> what do you want you know but it, it's it's and, and that's when you know you're on your journey you're on the right journey it's a spiritual aspect to it it's not just your textbooks you know you got to get deep into that 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 getting all that trauma and trying to ease it and then it, it's just a different life when you do yeah. that and one thing i'll add to that is you know um yeah, like, like you said, you know, a lot of your life experiences will actually start to make sense when you connect in that way. Uh, I had a similar experience. I used to have a uh, tecolote um, over here in my backyard. And he was here for, I, I'd say like three years, you know, he would come and we hear him at night, like he'll come and like, he'll come close to us and just be staring, you know? And I always wondered like, well, what's going on here? That He turned out to be my Noambi, you know? The, and this whole time I didn't know but um, it all just kind of made sense that he had that connection, you know, uh, in the same way that you had the connection with, with uh, the hawk. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it's um, like now whenever I see a chapulín or a tlacuache in my backyard, to me, I mean, those are ancestral animals that were important to our, 
to our ancestors and we saw as relatives, you know, and uh, like when I see them in my backyard now, it's just confirmation for me. Like, oh yeah, they're, they're coming, they're attracted, you know, they're attracted to this place for a reason. Uh, Sending you signs often. Yeah, I, 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 think grew, I grew, I grew, I grew Nopal in the backyard. That thing is like a huge tree now, you know? <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, it's just, I mean, those are all, because a lot of people I see, they grow it and it just doesn't grow or it gets rotten or whatever, you know. But yeah, the, all of these things are signs and affirmations. You know, morning glory just started growing randomly in my backyard. That's a really important um, Native American plant and just beautiful purple flowers, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, signs that you can see and just affirm your uh, you know, that you're going the right direction. So yeah. somebody recently asked me that, like how, if our tribe's extinct, that word again, uh, how do we even try to decolonize? And I was like, well, first of all, you have to hear the calling of your ancestors. And I, I feel like I lost the person after that. It was just like, whoop, whoop. <laughs> you know, um, but it really is. I feel kind of like it's a calling, like they call you kind of home, you know, and then they, like, I, like I had told you that I was, really lurk, looking for some more knowledge and some more information and I remember that I, I had ran into you in one of these groups and your knowledge and I was like I, I it was like you were almost like put on my path so that I can continue to learn and that's kind of what ancestors do for you um, and I don't think that it's this um, guy in, the, in a white robe up in the sky with long hair on a throne you know I, I just don't believe that I believe that your ancestors I don't believe that when your ancestors die, they forget you. That's just, that's a very Christian way of thinking. I don't believe that at all. And I've never believed that. I've always felt connected to my ancestors once they left um, this realm, right? Um, so I think that, you know, when, if you're going to try to decolonize, you might want to try to hear what they're trying to tell you, if they're speaking to you. <laughs> Hopefully they are, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing I want to say, because I, at this we're going to probably wrap up right um but some people have an issue with some of us calling ourselves chicano they're like oh no call yourself native american well i just want to kind of put it out there that um chicano is a nawa word and it is a word that our community gave ourselves and so native american I know what people are trying to say. Oh, we should kind of all connect to each other. But Native American, you can. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. But to say either or, I think that's where it becomes a problem. And Native American is not even a, a, a word we came up with. So to, to kind of say, oh, well, yeah, that, that term Chicano, it's, it's, it should be sunsetted. Why? I mean, you're, you're benefiting from it. <laughs> you know, like you're benefiting from that movement. And practicing Chicanismo is you know, decolonizing and breaking colonial chains and doing the work, right? So I wanna leave people with this and then I want you to give the final thought. But my final thought is, if you're going to go around claiming you're indigenous, you have to do the work. You have to go out there and try to learn. You have to be about it, not just talk about it. You can't just talk about being indigenous. You gotta be about it. You gotta be indigenous. You gotta be in that world. If you're not there, then you shouldn't be claiming it. You're kind of a poser. I mean, even if your blood says you are, but if, but there are so many people out there um, that their blood says they're one thing and they're living a life of another. So you, that's what those people are trying to say when they say blood doesn't matter. It's the life you're leading. And um, so that's to those people. To the other, other side is that, you know, and I wanna borrow, there is something that I've heard in some of these podcasts that I did like, which is, you know, there was a point that they made. They said that black people, they could be 40% black if they appear as black and they're being treated as black and they're in that black community, then they're not gonna, somebody's not gonna say, oh yeah, you're not black. You're not black because you're not part of the African tribe. And I thought that was a really good point in that one podcast that I read, that I watched. I was like, oh, that is a very good point. When Barack Obama was raised with a white woman, right? He was raised with a white woman and he was half black. I don't even think he knew his dad that well, but guess what? What do we say him as? Black. So, and he's living the black life, right? He married a black woman. He's living that black life now. I, I guess sort of, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for 
for them, that's for the black community to decide. But um, I'm saying is that there's nobody denying that from him. So don't deny us. I can see if we're coming around with our 1% and saying it, sure. Or if we're saying we only have a test, but we're not living the life, sure. But don't deny us if we're not, if we are living that life and we are obviously, we look it. I mean, you know, but I'll let you finish up. So many, so many people are trying to attack the Chicano identity right now. It's just, it's laughable, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a very strong identity. We know who we are, we know what our culture is, and we know where we come from. And so no matter what they try to do, uh, you know, it's not gonna work because, I mean, we, we know that Chicano is indigenous and we live it, like you said, and you can identify another Chicano, right? You, you know who they are. And, and that's, that's, what it, that's what it's about to be a part of a community. Um, a native community is like, hey, you, you understand each other, you can talk to each other, you recognize uh, each other, you you have connections with that culture. You are the same people. And, and you're descendants of the people who were first here. That's exactly right. And and that's all you need to know. <laughs> if you live that culture, then you mean, no, no attack is going to you know, weaken it. Yeah, the last thing I'll say is um, just, uh, you know, like you said, continue living in the indigenous life. Just start researching. Like, what were the what were the plants that were nearby your area? You know, go plant some maguey in the backyard or cactus in the backyard, and just caretaking. Just just take care of it, and then you'll learn a lot about being indigenous just from that, right? Uh, just from watching it grow and taking care of it. Though these are the things that our ancestors did, and uh, burning copal, like you said, is very powerful. Uh, because this is the copal is actually a very sacred um, it's a very sacred incense for our ancestors because it comes from the sap of a of trees in Mexico and our ancestors saw that as uh, the blood of the trees and so when you're burning the copal you're actually offering something very sacred um, you know and so uh, so just learn why we do these things and yeah it'll all like it'll all just kind of come together and 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 eventually you you know you'll find like wow I, I understand a lot like you you will feel like you understand the worldview because it all just kind of connects but the key here is just be patient don't um, try to rush it don't try to claim any um, tr uh, northern tribes or even southern tribes you know just um, do what you can uh, what you know continue uh, your own practices and just keep building on that and and that's all that's all you need to do. So I wanna thank you. This is my Demachtiani who's been teaching me a lot. And I appreciate that what you have been teaching me because it's, I, I found the piece that I have been searching for for decades and it is coming to me and I am learning um, who I am and who my people are. So thank you so much and goodbye guys. All right, Bye. Right. thanks for having me. Ah, this is